Hello, friends. Scott Sullivan here, Georgia Baptist Discipleship, and uh, so excited to be joined today by Dallas White. And friends, we are so glad that you are viewing with us. And just remember, this group, Georgia Baptist Discipleship, we exist to resource, inspire, and create disciple makers. That's why this Facebook group is here. And we got folks really from all over Georgia and all over the nation. And uh, the truth is, Dallas, we've even got some folks from Mexico, England, uh, Haiti, all over the world that are members of this group because we all have the same goal. We're trying to figure out how best to walk as a disciple and then make disciples. So, uh, man, so glad for you to be here with us, Dallas. So, folks, let me give you just a little bit of background on Dallas. He is the pastor at the Grove Church in Ackworth, Georgia, and uh, I'll let him share a little bit of his context in a second. But I just want you all to know that when we have people on these broadcasts, um, we're not just picking folks, you know, here or there just so we can fill a spot. We really try to get high capacity leaders who have something to say and can be a resource for you. So uh, as you're watching today, please comment below. Let us know who you are. Let us know where you're from. And as always, uh, Dallas, we give free swag away. So somebody will be chosen from a comment below and uh, we'll, we'll send you some cool resource materials, all kind of neat things that we pull from. So make sure you leave a comment. And, uh, but Dallas is one of those guys that, you know, 5.30 in the morning, the guy is already in the Word, has his cup of coffee, and is working through a to-do list, is um, spending time with the Lord, praying over things, preparing, resourcing, leads at such a high level. So, uh, Dallas, anytime I get a chance to have folks like you on here, it's a blessing to me, and uh, so glad and grateful for you joining us today. And, and really, you know, personally and uh, even selfishly, it's not just cool that you're a pastor at the Grove, you're one of our discipleship consultants. So you're, you're resource and leaders, you're uh, answering questions, all that sort of thing. So uh, Dallas, jump in here. Give us a little background about you and your family, bro. Yeah, well, joy to be here. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share. And uh, for those of you who are watching, thank you for, for joining us today. I hope you will engage. That's why we do these. Uh, that's why I'm excited about being a part is because we, we want to engage with you. We want to have opportunities to connect and, and talk in more detail. So in the chat below at any time, man, throw out questions, throw out ideas. Uh, we want we want to hear from you. But as Scott said, um, serve as the pastor at the Grove Church. Two and a half years we have been here. Prior to that, we spent some time at First Baptist Church Woodstock serving on staff there. And uh, really for the last eight or nine years, my heart has been gripped with a passion for making disciples. I realized about uh, eight or nine years ago that in my own life, I was doing ministry, I was doing activity, but I really couldn't point to uh, individuals whose lives were looking more like the Lord Jesus because of my intentional investment in them. And so it was a game changer for me, that realization. And really just my wife and I, uh, her name's Amanda, we have four boys. We just committed our lives, the rest of our lives, to helping people, we say, discover the joy of knowing Jesus and making him known. And uh, we found so much joy in that. We want to share that joy with others. And one way we do that, obviously, is through our ministry at the local church. But what a joy to be able to do it here for uh, so many pastors and leaders in our state convention. So yeah, excited to be here today and excited to jump into the, the conversation. Love it. Love it. You mentioned your kids. One of the things that I loved in the article uh, that we will be dropping into the comments here is about how your kids and you know, telling stories there and how, uh, and me having three boys as well and a daughter, um, man, I just, I laughed when I read this. You said, we don't have to teach our kids to ask this one word, why? You know, God, man, my head was just like started to, about to explode when, you, when I read that, just laughing and thinking about all the times I walked in. And that brings in the first question here. So as I thought about that, why do we do small groups? You know, because it's a, it's a big push to have these groups, to, to not just have the large group layer, but to have this smaller group intimate layer. Why do we do that, Dallas? Yeah, great question. And, and in the article, I, I'm talking specifically about my, my second son. He's five years old right now. His name is Cooper. Uh, praise the Lord. Just gave his life to Christ a couple of weeks ago as a result of asking these why, 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 why questions. Uh, so why can be a good thing. Uh, sometimes as parents, it can rub on us a little bit. But it is a good thing that our kids are always asking why, because it gives us opportunities to engage with them in a way that, that really we, we don't get to engage with a lot of, uh, of people that are in our stage of life. Because 
truthfully, why is a question that sort of fades from our vocabulary over time? We get into the, the weeds of what and how, and there's some good conversations there, but why is such an important question? And so we're asking that question today, why do small groups? And I, I think, Scott, the real answer there um, for me came from some experiences that I had coaching, coaching football. I love the game of football. And one thing that anybody who's ever been to a football practice knows is um, very little time in that football practice is spent with the entire team working together. There is some team time built in, and it usually comes at the end of several other periods, but that time is where you're sort of putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. What's really taking place in the majority of that practice is you've got smaller groups working together. And the reason that coaches do that is because in the context of that smaller group, you can do some things you can't do on a larger scale. Your, your teaching can go more in depth. Your relationships can go more in depth. And what we find on the football field, I think we also find in the church, is that when we teach more in depth and we have more relational depth, oftentimes it means that our effectiveness increases, right? So if we spent all of our time in a large group setting, I mean, there may be some good things that are passed down, but ultimately we're missing the, the depth in teaching and the depth in relationship that really create effectiveness long-term. So I saw that on the football field for years as a, as a coach at, at various levels, and I've seen it as a pastor for many years that uh, the, the large group setting is so important and it's so key and we have to come together, but the small group setting actually serves to enhance what we do when we come together as a family of faith. So for me, that's the why of small groups is because it makes what we do in the large group so much better. That's great insight, Dallas, because, you know, one of the things that people hear from us when they talk about discipleship, Georgia Baptist discipleship, and our language is we think about how important balance is, that if you put all your eggs in the large group basket, you're going to struggle. Or if, if the only thing you do is small group, and, and, and our, uh, what we advocate for is a balanced approach, where you're engaging in a large group, you go deeper in that small group, and then uh, cross-train there. So good. Here's another question. You're right about Jesus being our model for life and ministry. Uh, can you elaborate on this concept of why having Jesus as the model is so important for disciple makers? Yeah. Well, a couple thoughts come to mind. Number one, I think what we tend to do a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this, so I want to I personally own this. I think what we do a lot of times in ministry is we know that spiritually speaking, we are to be made more and more like the Lord Jesus, right? But sometimes we can divorce that from the practices that he pursued. And so we say, yes, all day long, we want to become more like Jesus. We want to become more like Jesus. But if we're not careful, we can just say, okay, but we're going to do it our way. We're going to become more like Jesus, but we're going to do it our way. And I think there's something to be said for looking at the practices of the Lord Jesus and saying, okay, it's not just we want the same outcomes, right? We want to have the same character and the same nature. We want his heart to be uh, our heart. We want to look like him. But to say, hey, there's a reason that he did things the way that he did them. And so maybe the outcome is tied to the process, right? So looking to his life and learning from the way in which he did things. And I think that this is a beautiful approach because I think the Lord Jesus was so intentional in doing some things with specificity, but also in a way that allowed freedom within the different contexts that he knew his church would eventually reach. Uh, to, to do things in a way that would be effective in that particular context. So I think we look to the life of the Lord Jesus for some of the, the, the foundational guide rails that are going to give us traction in the area of making disciples. And then within those guide rails is where we start to say, okay, what is our context? Um, how can we make this conducive to our context within the framework of what the Lord Jesus has given us? And so I don't ever want to divorce my spiritual Christ-likeness from my practical Christ-likeness, which is doing the things that he did. Uh, and so that's really where um, my thoughts were when, when I was writing this article is, if ultimately being a disciple is about helping people become like the Lord Jesus, I think there's something to be said for modeling our efforts um, on his example. Mm. That's good. That's good. Now, one of the, you know, we're getting dozens of calls, you know, in the last 10 months of people saying, um, I don't have any kind of small groups ministry. 
uh, what, what are the benefits of that? You know, I keep hearing you talk about it. Or some people say, I've got this one particular style, but I'm looking to, to maybe move to a small groups ministry. Uh, what are the benefits for somebody who may be watching or asking some of those questions? What are some of the benefits of a strong, healthy small groups ministry? Yeah, well, I think we can look to the life of the Lord Jesus and, and see some of those things um, tangibly. And then I, I would just say I have personally experienced uh, many of these things over the course of my life in the context of a small group. And so um, obviously, the, the, I mentioned earlier the in-depth nature of the teaching. Uh, you know, we get in in our gatherings or our worship services on Sundays, we, we um, relate to the Word of God in a, a specific way. It's, it's the Word of God preached, right? And we need that. That is a critical component of the Christ life is the Word of God being preached or proclaimed, right? Um, but in a, in a small group, uh, we complement that, I believe, by giving people the opportunity to, to make the Word of God personalized, right? So how does what was preached become personal? How does it become practical in my life? And oftentimes that happens as we take those same passages that we're hearing in the context of a sermon given on Sunday and digging deeper into them so we can learn more what this looks like, not just for our Sundays, but for our Mondays and our Tuesdays and our Wednesdays, right? So letting the word of God become um, uh, practical theology for us. It's guiding the way that we're living our lives. Uh, of course, secondarily, uh, the relational aspect that I mentioned earlier. Again, in a Sunday morning setting, we might have 60 seconds or even maybe a few minutes carved out for fellowship or relational engagement. And even that now, if you're, if you're meeting back together in person, is sort of strained because of the social distancing rules that are in place. And so we need, we need opportunities and environments for relationships to be forged. We have a relational faith. There is, there's, there's no way around it. The Lord Jesus was relational. And so for us to uh, live our lives in the way that he did, we have to be a relational people. We're, we're created for relationship, right? We're formed in the image of God. And forever, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have existed in this wonderful relationship. And so we're created for that sort of relationship. And small groups often give us the opportunity to dive deeper into those relationships. And then, of course, in the context of relationships, you have opportunities for pastoral care, which um, many pastors who might be watching will know that that can become a burden if the pastor or a, a certain staff member is expected to carry the load of pastoral care for the entire faith family. Well, when you've broken your faith family down into smaller groups and you've empowered the leaders of those groups to lead out in pastoral care, that burden on the pastor or staff member is alleviated to some degree. It doesn't mean you just check out of it completely, but it does give you the opportunity to empower others to accomplish things within the life of the faith family. So you, as the apostles did in Acts chapter six, can continue to be devoted to prayer and to the word or to the other responsibilities that you might have. So those would be just a few things that right off the top of my head, I would say, give us some, um, that they're helpful for us and they're needed for us in the context of, of modern ministry. We, we have to have those things. So good, Dallas. And I heard you mention something about, you know, application and you talk about some of these accountable relationships and what we teach on our discipleship team when folks stand to, to give the word of God is to teach the meat of the lesson. And here's what I, I mean by that, that the motivation, the M is motivation where you get their attention. The E is examination where the text is the heart of the lesson. The fellowship's not, the application's important, but you want to teach the word of God. And then application, the A, is where you help them understand how it applies to life. But one of the things that's always struck me when we're teaching is um, there's been so few times when, when we teach in that small group setting that we help, we help our, our people understand that there's a takeaway or, or what are you going to do based on what Dallas White just taught that's going to make a difference in your life this week. And I'm just telling you that that T, adding that T to the lesson and helping people understand the takeaway and then maybe following up the next week is, hey, well, uh, well, Bill, you mentioned last week, your takeaway was how did that go with your wife or with your child? Man, just so important. It's just a huge benefit. I, I love that you brought that out in, uh, in your presentation. And, uh, and personally, Dallas, 
when I think about these, these small groups like that, uh, I've got a, a couple of pastors and a guy here at the board that's in one with me. And it's for me, the thing that I don't get necessarily as much in my Sunday school or life group is the accountability. That aspect is huge for me. And you would think, oh, he's in charge of the discipleship for the state of Georgia. I'm just telling you, if I didn't have accountability, I wouldn't be memorizing scripture. Right now, we're, we're trying to work through Philippians chapter four and memorize that chapter. Dude, I don't memorize chapters of scripture, but I can tell you this, when I show up in that meeting, in that Zoom with those guys, I don't want to be the schmuck who didn't memorize his scripture. You right. know, right. it's just important. So uh, folks, thanks for watching this. Dallas, man, you make me a better leader. So thank you for being awesome. Thank you for loving your wife, loving your kids, and uh, being such an advocate in the local church to make disciples, to set up great disciple-making processes so that can be a model for other people. But also, I mean, what you do as a husband, as a dad, and as a pastor is every week, 50, 60 hours a week. And the fact that you would come on our team and be willing to help be a small group specialist and invest in other churches in Georgia is just huge. So thank you for doing that. And remember folks, if you're watching our video, uh, make sure to leave a comment. We'll give some free swag away. And as always, I would just want to remind you, we're able to do this because your church gives cooperative program dollars. If you don't do that, none of this is possible. So thank you for allowing us to be able to train and resource and inspire disciple makers in Georgia. If you want more information, you can go to gabaptist.org forward slash discipleship. Got a brand new website, got all of our names and contact information on there. And we're uploading content and training resources every single week. And also, if you know of a friend that could benefit from these discussions, have them get on to Georgia Baptist Discipleship Facebook group and uh, answer a couple of questions we'd love for you or them to join our tribe. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you guys next week.